rough-legged hawks. Several were seen soaring about. One pair were building a nest on a shelving ledge of cliffs, just around the first bends of the river, facing the south. Noticed several old nests at various points on the cliffs. Uluksuak and other Eskimos moved to the east today, with sleds on the sea ice. They're going to camp during the early summer near the mouth of a small creek, in a bay west of Cape Lambert, where they say there is good fishing for salmon trout. Kokotak, Hitchcock, and their families started packing over to Fishing Lake to be gone five sleeps. Mr. Wilkins starting after them with his cinematograph on a two-wheeled cart and two dogs. The natives have speared about 60 fish since they were here. The fish run upstream somewhat irregularly and become impounded in a system of wing dams and enclosures in which the natives spear the fish or catch them in their hands. The cook went out into a narrow bay in the canoe and drove two yellow-billed loons up towards the mouth of the creek and they became entangled in the gill net and he brought them both in alive. I anchored them with a cord and a stone attached to the leg and Wilkins and I took a number of pictures. When I put them on the ground, perfectly free, they seemed unable to fly up, but made towards the water, running awkwardly and flapping their wings along the ground. As soon as the sea ice conditions allowed ship travel in August 1915, Dr. Anderson traveled east from Bernard Harbor to Bathurst Inlet on the schooner North Star. The geologists had left earlier by dog sled and umiak. Once reunited, the party of scientists surveyed and mapped copper-bearing rocks in the Bathurst Inlet area, collected hundreds of specimens, and explored, mapped, and recorded the local names of islands and rivers along the coast. We sailed out at about 4.35 p.m. There was a little loose ice just in the harbor entrance, but the outer bay was clear. Ice was heavy outside. Broad leaves were visible, however, and the ice was moving. Castle, Chipman, and I will stand deck watches. Crawford and Wilkins will take shifts in the engine room. Foggy all morning, ran around the north edge of Westbury Island. Several small islands north of Westbury Island and a large island, Adlagak, close to it on the north and west. Saw a large white wolf on the flat hills back about half a mile from the river. Then three yellowish cubs and one more white wolf. The large white wolf retreated to the top of the higher hills and watched us for some time as we went on. Mutfa, Kanuyak, and Kyolina returned about noon, packing about ten caribou skins, fat and marrow, also some meat. They had camped out without a tent for three or four days. I sketched a map of our summer voyage, and Mupfa, Ituk, and others gave me the place names. Anderson traveled up the Coppermine River a second time, trying to get expedition reports and mail out to Ottawa. Arctic Hare Mupfa shot a white hare which was crouched among rocks on Talus Slope on the north side of the Eskimo Island. We rounded the point and headed for the southwest end of Hepburn Island, Igluhagyuk, where we could see a village of caribou skin tents on the ice at the foot of the cliffs. We reached the village about 4 o'clock p.m. The people scurried into their houses, but soon came out and stood in a line, motionless. When about a hundred yards away, I thought to hold up my hands, with magical result, for they broke ranks and came running to us. Howick said he'd often heard of me, Anahina, from his old friend, Ulipsina, whom I saw in April 1911, and said he was very glad to see me. With their studies completed, the Southern Party scientists returned from Bathurst Inlet in June 1916 and began preparations for their return to Ottawa. With 27 people, 25 dogs, and tons of scientific cargo, the schooner Alaska left the expedition headquarters in mid-July. Saw a large polar bear swimming in the sea about two miles off Bailey Island. We turned about 400 yards out of our course to run close to him and every camera on board took snapshots of him. The bear swam almost as fast as the ship and piled the foam up ahead of beam, leaving a wake like a steamboat. 
The Southern Party discharged their local assistants at Bailey and Herschel Islands. The Alaska was much less crowded when she left Herschel Island, with only three crew members and six scientists on board. The men worked hard as the Alaska encountered heavy ice, practically all the way from the international boundary to Point Barrow, Alaska. The scientists were back in Ottawa by October 1916, thus successfully completing the planned three-year expedition. The Southern Party returned with thousands of specimens of animals, plants, fossils and rocks, thousands of artifacts from the Copper Inuit and other Eskimo cultures, and over 4,000 photographs and 9,000 feet of movie film. At the end of the Canadian Arctic Expedition, Anderson was appointed as editor of the scientific reports of the CAE. Did you ever see the grave?